of the working class and to organize the whole society for the benefit of capitalism. Now, Lenin doesn't care whether the society is a dictatorship in a liberal sense. You, know, you could have electoral democracy, for example, and yet be a dictatorship of capitalism at the same time. You know, he would see the United States in the current context as a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. Right, so the job of the Vanguard Party is to establish the dictatorship of the proletariat. Um, now that doesn't mean a military dictatorship necessarily, but it means a type of government and a type of society where state power is used for the opposite way that it's currently used. Instead of using it to support capitalism and capitalists, use the state power to help the exploited classes, use the state power to organize society to benefit the working class and its allies. So one of the main divisions in socialist thought was over this issue of revisionism. You know, everything seemed okay, the Russian Revolution was successful, the Chinese Revolution was successful, there were a bunch of other socialist revolutions that were successful. Everything looked like it was going well, until this huge fight erupted between the Soviet Union and China, and what we call the Sino-Soviet split, and um, you'll study it more if you do international relations. So, the Sino-Soviet split was really the outgrowth of a political debate that existed between Nikita Khrushchev in the USSR and Mao in China. Um, it mirrored a domestic political debate in China where Mao had debates with uh, Liu Xiaoqi, Peng Dehuai, and Deng Xiaoping. So these are sort of debates about what type of policies China would follow, what socialism meant, how to get to this socialism, whatever it is, um, what course China should take. Right? So, there was a repetition of these debates both on the domestic and the international stage. One of the key bases of this debate is what we call the theory of productive forces. So I've already argued that Marxism gives central importance to the development of productive forces in the way it thinks about theory. Um, but there are many people who criticize certain interpretations of Marxism for giving just too much emphasis to the economy, saying that the economy decides everything what we call economic determinism. Now, um, we don't have enough time to discuss this today, but Soviet Marxism did tend towards this view, a view that said, well, the development of productive forces is the most important thing, and all of the other goals are secondary. As long as you develop productive forces, socialism will follow, necessarily, from this. Okay, so, what we'll see is that Maoism, so Chairman Mao's arguments, are a response to this view, and a criticism of this view, you know, um, Maoism tries to answer why socialist societies end up going back towards capitalism. And Mao's main critique of other Marxist thinkers is that they focus too much on the development of productive forces, on development, and ignored the relations of production, ignored politics, ignored culture. Right? So Maoism begins as a critique of this theory of productive forces. And for Mao, socialism isn't a thing that can be built. If you look into the way that Soviet writers describe socialism, they talk about building socialism. Like socialism is a thing you can construct, it's a physical entity. For Mao, socialism is a process where we reshape society. Um, either you're on the, road, on the socialist road, you're traveling down the socialist road, or you're traveling down the road to capitalism. It's a process, it's not a thing. Right, so, in this socialist road, the working class and other progressive classes used their power and developed the conditions for a future communist society. And Mao's overall point is that if you're not developing the future conditions for communist society, you're developing the conditions for capitalism to come back. And those are the two choices. So Marxist theory previously said that the economic base of society determines the superstructure. So culture, politics, traditions, and so on. And Mao's important contribution to this is to say that, well, even if the economic base of society becomes socialist, you, know, you take away the capitalist property, you conduct land reform, you, you know, place things under public or government ownership, that doesn't change certain important things. So all cultural, political, social traditions, for example, the division between intellectuals and workers. Intellectuals, you, me, our social class, tend not to like the working class very much, right? Tend not to see them positively. And they make scornful remarks. They make fun of them. They uh, more than make fun of them, they exploit the position of power that they have. 
right? Intellectuals have knowledge and use that knowledge to control the working class in many ways. Um, the division between cities and rural areas. Rural areas are fundamentally important. You know, there's like a slogan from the National Farmers Federation of Australia, who even if you think that they're bad, they make a legitimate point where they say, no farmers, no food. In other words, we exist because some people grow food for us to eat. Right, so rural areas are essential to the survival of humanity, but nobody treats them as serious or important. Right? People think of them as backward or bad or not something you want to be associated with. And the division between technical knowledge and political leadership. So this is where some people in the society have a monopoly over the knowledge that they have. Doctors, lawyers, engineers, accountants, people like that. Um, who have a monopoly over certain areas of knowledge and use that knowledge to exploit the rest of society. You know, so they're able to charge people lots of money for the knowledge that they have. You know, and maintain political advantages as a result of that knowledge. So, one of the next important contributions of Maoist thought, um, compared to all of the previous thinkers in Marxism, they all said that the Communist Party is always good. And Mao is kind of the first political thinker within Marxism to say, actually, the Communist Party is where this pressure to go back to capitalism comes from. It can become corrupt just like any other institution. It can produce the new capitalist class. You know, and the evidence of that is if you look at the people who became rich in the, uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed, almost all of them had connections to the old Communist Party. Right? So, in a way, the Maoists kind of look right. You know, even if you disagree with them about what to do about this problem. You, know, you may think the Cultural Revolution was bad. Right? But their overall point that communism and the Communist Party can produce capitalism is not entirely wrong. Right? So Mao said that the Communist Party itself was responsible for bringing capitalism back to the Soviet Union. And that certain leaders in China, like Deng Xiaoping, were restoring capitalism in China. And therefore, there was a big debate about whether they should be allowed to have political power or not. All right, which leads to this famous slogan, which if you don't believe anything else I previously said, um, Bombard, the headquarters, is pretty much the definitive slogan of Maoism. It says, well, even the Communist Party is not beyond criticism. If it tries to bring back capitalism, attack it too, just like you attack the rest of society. I mean, this was one of the most influential slogans of the Cultural Revolution. You know, at least, hopefully after that explanation, you understand where it came from. So, this brings us to certain questions like, when did capitalism come back in the Soviet Union? Right, it's a fairly easy question, you think. But then, we can see how ideology affects that question. You know, if you're a Western liberal or a conservative, you look at, well, the Communist Party lost power in 1989 to 1991, and so the end of the Cold War happened at that time, and so, okay, obviously socialism declined in the USSR at that time, right? Maoists, because of their ideology, look at it differently, and they say, well, capitalism came back in the Soviet Union perhaps as early as 1956, right, when Nikita Khrushchev came to power and started bringing back more versions of private property and profit and stuff like that. You know, even if we disagree with them, and they certainly disagree with each other, like people disagree about when capitalism came back. But what we can see is that ideology here is interpreting the same fact, you know, capitalism in the former Soviet Union, in a different way. Um, and that Maoists have argued that a new capitalist class came to power in the Communist Party, right, and used the power of the Communist Party to control the means of production and turn themselves into the new capitalist class. Now, you need to decide whether you think that's an appealing argument or not. Is it realistic to say um, that the Communist Party becomes the new capitalist class or not? And there are certainly lots of arguments in favor and against this from lots of different writers. So I'm happy to suggest some reading for you if you want. So this brings us to the discussion of Deng Xiaoping theory, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's important I guess because China's important, right? Um, so the current official ideology, even enmeshed in the Chinese constitution, is that Deng Xiaoping theory is a natural outgrowth of Mao's thought. And there's a lot of problems with this idea. Um, I'm going to try and demonstrate now the reason why this is logically inconsistent, right? And see if it makes sense to you. So Deng Xiaoping theory is important 
Firstly, because China is now one of the more important countries in the world. And Deng Xiaoping theory has been an important part of China since the 11th Congress in 1978. All right, so um, what are the key principles? Well, the first key concept is what we call the primary phase of socialism. So this is an argument that China and any country that has a lower level of development than so-called industrialized countries must support capitalism for some time because only capitalist methods can develop the technical basis for socialism. You know, until you reach a certain level of economic development, um, you can't fully do socialism. Right? So Deng Xiaoping theory is explicitly a theory of productive forces. It says a certain level of development is necessary in order to reach socialism in the future. Secondly, market socialism, or what we call socialism with Chinese characteristics. So this is an idea that socialism can coexist with the market, can coexist with capitalist methods. There's no necessary contradiction between the two things. Right? This is combined with pragmatism, which is an argument that short-term thinking or short-term success in one area should guide policy, not ideology. So the saying that it doesn't matter if a cat is black or white as long as it catches mice, it's a famous Dengist saying. And it basically summarizes this method of pragmatism. That, you know, policy shouldn't be driven by political thought. You know, we just want results, whatever that is. Right? And then there's the four cardinal principles, which I don't know. I've studied this stuff for years, and I honestly can't tell you the deep meaning of it. Why? Because even the people who write these concepts don't explain what they mean. Right? Upholding the basic spirit of communism, uh, what the hell is the basic spirit of communism? Right? Nobody explains what that means. It's just a general guideline statement. Um, uphold the People's Democratic Dictatorship political system, that's just the Communist Party in power. Upholding the leadership of the Communist Party, that's just the Communist Party in power. Um, upholding Marxism, Leninism, and Mao Zedong thought. It's kind of like, you can't give up your history entirely, right? Because you know you're not going to be in power if it wasn't for Marxism and if it wasn't for Mao, right? So you obviously have to have some sort of legitimacy and you look back into the history of different leadership, and that's how you get your legitimacy. Right? But again, no explanation is given about, well, what parts of Marx we agree with or disagree with, what parts of Lenin we agree with or disagree with, what parts of Mao we agree with or disagree with. Because all of those thinkers say significant things about the way the world is and about the changes that the world needs to make in order to get to socialism that seem to have almost nothing to do with the way China currently is. Right. And yet, they want you to uphold all those different diverse thinkers and what they believe about socialism. So, while we haven't got a time for a thorough critique of Deng Xiaoping theory, um, it should be clear that there is no relationship between Maoist thought and between Deng Xiaoping theory. They are almost opposite ways of doing politics. They have no connection at all. Right? The only connection is that the, the two individuals, Mao and Deng, we're in the same political party, and that's it, right? But their ideas are totally unconnected, right? They are the opposite way of opposing politics. So Maoism talks about remaining on the socialist path and extending political and economic power to the exploited. Degas theory says capitalist market development is completely compatible with this. You know, that you can use capitalist methods to achieve socialism. Maoism says that there needs to be an economic, social, and cultural revolution. The revolution doesn't end once you've taken power. You need to keep revolutionizing the society at all times. Right? Degas' theory says that you should have economic development by itself, and that development of productive forces will create socialism in the end. Um, Maoism emphasizes ideology and the long-term development of socialism, whereas Deng Xiaoping theory is short-termist and pragmatic. In every possible way, there are different ways of thinking. You know, I'm not saying that one is significantly better than others. It's not my place to comment on that at this point. You know, like everybody has private opinions about what's correct and wrong. Right? I'm just saying, objectively, as a political scientist who's looking at two different sets of ideas, these are not related ideas. Right? These are opposite ideas. So when you're being asked to believe that they're the same idea, it's kind of extremely misleading. So this raises the question about whether capitalism is back in China, and uh, lots of people have different opinions about this too. In the West, 
the main criticism people make of China is like a liberal criticism. Oh, the Communist Party, aren't they evil? You know, uh, how dare they remain in power? We thought they were going to leave once the Soviet Union collapsed. But they're still in power, right? Um, so it's kind of like a right-wing criticism, you know, let's abolish the Communist Party and restore parliamentary democracy, which China never had, but, you know, whatever. Um, modern Maoists criticize China for a different reason. They say, well, you guys are kind of sold out. You know, you were the beacon of socialism, and now you're some of the richest people in the world. You have one of the most unequal societies in the world. You know, you seem to be a leader in capitalism, despite the fact that you sort of celebrate under this, like, communist symbols and things like that. But you seem to do capitalism pretty well, or something that looks a lot like capitalism even if you claim to be a communist party. Right, so the reason I bring up this example is to say, well, it sort of re-emphasizes this left and right wing criticism that you can make of any political ideology just about. So in summary, we've looked at today lots of different forms of socialist theory in a very broad summary. I mean, we don't have enough time. We could probably run a whole course on socialist thought. Um, but I've condensed it today into one single lecture. Socialism and social democracy are both strongly egalitarian political theories. Right? If you talk to a socialist or a social democrat, they will tell you that they want an equal society, a society where people, uh, their life chances are not determined by whether they're born rich or poor or something like that. Right? So they advocate for strong forms of equality. We've also looked at the difference today between socialism Marxism, social democracy, so the big debates that exist between these interpretations of what socialism should be. Right. Importantly, we've covered splits within socialist thought. Uh, I mean, like, to give you an example, in India there are something like 40 communist parties. You know, in China there's one. Um, but in India there's like 40 communist parties. You know, socialists have a unique ability to disagree with each other over very small things to the extent that they magnify these differences and create new political parties as a result of it, right? They're especially bad at agreeing with each other, especially bad at compromise, I think. So, we've looked at a contemporary example of this in China where we see the division between Maoism and Deng Xiaoping theory is the latest manifestation of um, political debates that exist. You know, it raises certain important questions, you know. A lot of commentators in the West think, oh, is Xi Jinping going to restore a more hardened version of socialism in China? Or is he just another leader like Jiang Zemin or somebody like that who's powerful but doesn't really have a big commitment to socialist ideas? You know, who knows? And you know, that's your job to answer that, you future political scientist, you. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have about socialism, uh, but I hope that as a result of this you sort of have some sense of the debates and basic principles of socialist thought.